Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please go ahead and take a seat. We can get started tonight. I want to welcome you to the uh, first in our lecture series on the Inklings. As you know, this uh, Honors College joint venture lecture series with the English department is now in its third year. We're entering our third season, and uh, we're looking forward to what we think is going to be a very fresh and exciting topic for us. Uh, you know, in the past, two years ago, we did a, a series much like this on the English Civil War. And last year, we, uh, we looked at, at Florence from Dante to Machiavelli. This year, we turn a sort of a more literary bent as we look at very important, maybe arguably, in fact, the single most important literary group ever formed uh, on this earth. That is the Inklings, which included, of course, famously, it included uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and, and C.S. Lewis as well as others we'll talk about in a moment. When it comes to book clubs, you probably, your mind automatically rushes to Oprah Winfrey, I would assume. <laughs> but this informal group of, of authors uh, turned out to be remarkably influential. In the early 1930s, uh, Tolkien formed a small reading group among some of his friends. This is no joke, to read and discuss Icelandic mythology. <laughs> it did not last long. But through that group, he met a new friend, C.S. Lewis. And the two of them found themselves in yet another informal discussion group uh, called the Inklings, founded by an undergraduate at Oxford University, uh, a, a man named uh, Lean. I suppose that's a real name. And Lean's group formed to sort of just openly discuss literary topics, and um, apparently he wasn't very dedicated because it too didn't last very long. But according to... Uh, According to uh, uh, Lewis's own diary, his initial uh, interaction with Tolkien was very positive. In fact, uh, this is a quote from his diary, quote, there's no harm in him, only needs a good smack. <laughs> that, that's, that's literally true. Around, somewhere around the year 1933, uh, sort of based on the breakup of the initial inklings, uh, Lewis and Tolkien hatched their own plan to form a, a reading group, and, and this is the group that, that came to really be known in history. Uh, it did last a long time. They started somewhere around 1933, it seems, and, and met more or less regularly uh, through 1962. Uh, according to Tolkien in his own diary, he says, quote, the name, Inklings, was transferred by CSL to the undetermined, unelected circle of friends who gathered about CSL in his rooms at Maudlin College. And they met, apparently, on Thursday evenings regularly uh, in his rooms, but also, I'm gonna be careful how I put this now, they also met on Tuesday evenings at a local pub known as the Eagle and Child. Now, I'm not saying that I have first-hand knowledge of this. I'm just saying that even to this very day, you can go to that pub, sit at the table they sat, sat at, and drink a pint of whatever they used to drink. The Inklings, of course, included Lewis and Tolkien, uh, most famously, but a number of other literary luminaries passed in and out of that group over the years, including uh, Owen Barfield and Charles Williams, as well as some others uh, that we might not be able to talk about this year. But also, uh, Tolkien's own son, Christopher, if you're a real Tolkien fan, you know how important Christopher Tolkien was, because it was really him who helped take some of those manuscripts and turn them into publishable works after his father had passed. So this year, over the course of six lectures, uh, as has been our tradition now for the past couple of years, we will look at the inklings from a variety of perspectives, disciplines, etc. And we start tonight with a, a very special presentation by our very own Louis Marcos. Some of you uh, probably know that uh, he has been involved in the lecture series from the beginning, and has, uh, we've always been delighted by his contributions. Uh, his role here at HBU, of course, he is the Robert H. Ray Chair in Humanities, a uh, very uh, prestigious position. He's a professor of English and scholar in residence at the university. He teaches courses on ancient Greece and Rome in the Honors College, as well as courses in Victorian literature, 17th century literature, even modern film from time to time. He's an internationally known C.S. Lewis scholar, uh, his uh, his uh, books include titles such as Apologetics for the 21st Century and Restoring Beauty, The Good, the True, and the Beautiful in the Writings of C.S. Lewis. So I say to you with no further introduction, it is my pleasure to welcome to the podium Dr. Lewis Marcos. Thank you all. It is good to be back. Uh, as Dr. Stacy told you, I am an English professor. 
And when you are an English professor, you have to answer a certain question again and again and again. Who cares about English? Who cares about literature? Why should I major in this? What good does this have in life? What value does it have? Well, I've got various answers to that, of course. But one of the answers that I give most often is simply this. All right, I will admit that literature may not have any survival value, but it brings value to survival. Now, I wish I could tell you that I made up that beautiful little turn of phrase, but actually I borrowed it from C.S. Lewis. And although I am sure that Lewis would approve of the way I'm using it, since he was also an English professor, when he used it, he was talking not about literature or the humanities. He was talking about friendship. When Lewis was about 60 years old, about four years before he died, he was encouraged by his wife, Joy, to write a book called The Four Loves. Now, how many of you have read that? Anybody here read The Four Loves? Oh, good. That's a lot of people. Some of you will be encouraged to read it after the speech this evening. The Four Loves looks at the four different words for love in Greek and analyzes them. Now, I'll bet most of you in this room know three of the Greek words for love. In fact, you've probably heard at least one sermon on this. The three words for love that many of you know is eros, which is more erotic, physical love. There is philia, which is friendship, as in the Philadelphia city of brotherly love. And then there is, of course, agape. Agape is God's self-giving love. If you translate agape into Latin, you get caritas. And if you translate it from Latin into good old King James, you get charity. That's why faith, hope, and love, faith, hope, and charity are the same thing. Unfortunately, our modern word charity has gotten reduced to meaning giving to the poor. Caritas and the old use of charity had the wider sense of love. Now, you're wondering what the fourth love is. That's the one we don't often hear. There's another word in Greek, and that is storge. And storge means affection. And Lewis wrote one chapter on each of the four loves. First, the three human loves, affection, friendship, eros, and then agape, God's self-giving love. Now, next month in October, I've got a book coming out, and it's going to be, we're going to do a book signing because it's called On the Shoulders of Hobbits, the Road to Virtue with Tolkien and Lewis. And because I am an English professor, and therefore I am obsessive-compulsive about form, I decided that this book had to be four square. It had to have four sections, and each section had to have four chapters. That's how you think when you are at least a traditional English professor, none of this free verse stuff. We want form. And now, it was pretty easy. I knew that the first section was going to be about the road, and the last section was going to be about the nature of evil. The two middle sections would have to be about virtue, because that's the central focus of the book. So how do you do it? Well, part of it was really easy. Most of you know that in the ancient pre-Christian world, there were four classical virtues. They're also known as the four cardinal virtues. Lewis talked about them all the time. Uh, Tolkien talked about them all the time. There's a section in Mere Christianity about the four cardinal or classical virtues. They are justice, wisdom or prudence, courage or fortitude, and temperance or self-control. So that was easy. Now, the trouble is that there are not four theological virtues. There are only three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. So what do you do with that missing chapter? Luckily, I had read enough Lewis and Tolkien and Aristotle to know what to do. For me and for Lewis, in between the classical and the Christian virtues was the virtue of friendship. I consider friendship one of the great virtues, that it should be on par with the others, somewhere in between the four classical and the three theological. And guess what? In the Honors College every year, I teach the freshmen the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle. Now, the ethics is very much about virtue. And so, of course, Aristotle talks about those four classical virtues. But guess what? He speaks more about friendship than all four other virtues combined. Almost two entire books of the Nick Ethics are devoted to friendship. He took friendship seriously. Lewis and Tolkien did. I try to take it seriously. In fact, 
I think it's appropriate to refer to Lewis and Tolkien as an apologist for friendship. And what I'm going to do is a little bit different than most of my speeches. In most of my speeches, I don't like looking at my outline at all. But because what Lewis did is, I think, so important in defending friendship in his book, The Four Loves, that you all hopefully have a handout, uh, and it's a one-page handout. It's kind of small print. I hope you don't go blind, but we're trying to save, save trees here. And what I have done is gather together some of the most important quotes, I think, from Lewis's section on friendship. And so I'm going to take you through those quotes. If, if you want to read along with me or just listen, uh, that's fine. But I'll read... Um, quote, and then sort of talk about it and elaborate on it. Starting with number one, Lewis says that to the ancients, he's thinking particularly ancient Greece and Rome, but he would probably include sort of Beowulf and the Anglo-Saxons, to the ancients, friendship seemed the happiest and most fully human of all the loves, the crown of life and the school of virtue. The modern world in comparison ignores it. Friendship is so important to the ancient world, probably best embodied in the Greco-Roman world in the friendship of Achilles and Patroclus. Unfortunately, in my honors class today, we killed off Patroclus, but anyway, I don't know if that's a good omen for the evening. Uh, also in the Bible, we have the wonderful friendship of David and Jonathan. Those of you who have read the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh know of El uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu. I mean, these famous friendships, and friendship was seen as one of the great and noblest of virtues. But what happened? Why does the modern world take it less seriously? Well, Lewis tells us that over the 19th century, two of the other loves, storge, affection, and eros, got better press than friendship and started taking over control. It starts in the early 19th century with my friends, the Romantic Poets. And I love the Romantic Poets, but they, you know, did some things that were a Pandora's box. But over the Romantic Age, there was a great deal of emphasis on affection. Family, uh, nature, affection for animals, all this stuff. Storge got a greater and greater press. Not, not necessarily bad. Uh, again, this is an exaggeration, but many of you have heard that the Romantics invented childhood. Now, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it is true that the Romantics helped us to see childhood as a distinct stage in development and as a good one that when children play, that is their work. And so because of that increase in childhood, and again, I like that, but it made affection more and more important. When we get to the end of the 19th century and move into the early 20th, along comes Sigmund Freud. And Freud takes Eros and makes it everything. And suddenly erotic love becomes everything. In our day, Hollywood has helped us to make Eros, the most important and central of all the loves. Now, Lewis is not saying those loves are unimportant, but because of the rise in reputation in Storge and Eros, it makes philia or friendship kind of left on the outside. Lewis wants to help bring it back to the center. Look at what he tells us about friendship. The next quote there. He says, sorry, affection, and he's talking about the ancients. To the ancients, Affection and eros were considered too obviously connected with our nerves, too obviously shared with the brutes. You could feel these tugging at your guts and fluttering in your diaphragm. But in friendship, in that luminous, tranquil, rational world of relationships freely chosen, you got away from all that. This alone of all the loves seem to raise you to the level of gods or of angels. In some ways, affection and eros choose us. They grab us at a very deep level. But friendship is something we choose. Friendship, again, has no survival value, but it brings value to survival. Lewis says that without eros, none of us would be born. Without storge, none of us would be nurtured or reared by our mother. But friendship? Friendship is not technically necessary. Now let me tell you something I often say uh, in my freshman classes. I pose a question and I say, 
Two of the most important relationships in the world is the relationship between the parents and the children and the relationship between the husband and the wife. And my question is, of those two relationships, which one is more central to civilization and the maintenance of civilized life, particularly something like a democracy? Now, I'm going to lose either way here because I have both my wife and my two children in the room. Um, but my argument is most students immediately will jump to the uh, parents' children. I would argue the more important relationship is that between the husband and wife. And I will explain why. Why do we love our children? Well, there are good reasons, but there's also the fact that we have no choice. They are our children, right? Even very bad people love their children. Now, I'm blessed with two excellent children. Uh, but even very bad people love their children. The unique thing about marriage, have you ever thought about it? In marriage, two people, no relationship, don't know each other, may have even grown up in different parts of the country, and yet they come together and combine everything that they have. Now, what I just said works in 47 of the states. You have to ignore Tennessee, Kentucky, and of course, Arkansas. Um, there it's a little bit different. But in the rest of the country, okay, there is no relationship here, okay? These are two people that don't know each other, and yet they are brought together, and by their own choice, again, this would be different in a place with arranged marriages, uh, one of which is actually Houston Baptist University, where we're, working, <laughs> where we're working on arranging the marriages, so we'll have another generation. But anyway, at least another legitimate generation. But anyway, that's my job. Um, <laughs> The thing about marriage is that we choose it, right? Many of the greatest political theorists, from Aristotle to John Locke, has told us that politics is in some senses a contract, a social contract, or a covenant, to use a more biblical word. And marriage is a covenant. You are agreeing with somebody that's not family to merge all that you have, unless you have a prenuptial agreement, to merge everything that you have. This is an amazing thing. And I would argue, and I, th I think Lewis would agree here, that in some sense, friendship is like that. You don't need friendship. It doesn't choose you. You choose it. It doesn't... Now, of course, marriage is different because it does have a survival value. But friendship, again, is something that we choose. He says a little bit more uh, in paragraph number one there. He says, friendship, free from instinct free from all duties but those which love has freely assumed, almost wholly free from jealousy and free without qualification from the need to be needed, is eminently spiritual. It is the sort of love one can imagine between angels. Now, you must understand we're talking about C.S. Lewis here. So whenever he refers to angels, he does mean the Bible, but he really means Milton's Paradise Lost. Okay, so he's thinking about the way the angels talk about their friendship, Raphael and all the different angels, and the way they communicate with one another. But again, in Storge and Eros, there's often this need to be needed that drives us towards it. And sometimes that's true in friendship. But often in friendship, Lewis wants to argue, it's a more free love. It's a freer love that we move towards. We don't really need it. We don't even necessarily need to be needed. Life doesn't need it, but life is certainly improved and enhanced by it. Aristotle says in the Nicomachean Ethics that, that you know, even though you don't need friendship, what, what value does life have if you don't have friendship? I mean, you can have all the riches in the world if you have no friends to share it with, then what does it mean, right? And we know it's a wonderful life. No man is a failure who has friends, if you remember at the end. Um, so, give you a sense of the importance of friendship. Now let's move into number two and we'll see Lewis getting a little bit more uh, careful about what he means by friendship by distinguishing it from other things, particularly the other loves. Lewis says, difference between lovers and friends. Lovers are normally face to face, absorbed in each other. Friends, side by side, absorbed in some common interest. Above all, Eros, while it lasts, is necessarily between two only. But two, far from being the necessary number for friendship, is not even the best. Dr. Stacy already told you a little bit about the Inklings. Lewis and Tolkien were very close friends, and they enjoyed their time alone, just the two of them, but they really enjoyed being with all of their friends at the Eagle and Child, which they called the Bird and Baby, or the B&B, &B, and they got together and drank their non-alcoholic non beer, uh, and participated in some friendship and camaraderie. 
Whereas eros, at least if you do it right, is only supposed to be two people, right? Um, friendship is not Friendship is not weakened when you divide it amongst more friends. It's actually increased or strengthened. Now, here and in a couple other parts of my speech this evening, a lot of times when Lewis is talking about friendship, he's really thinking more about male friendship. That's really the focus, partly because Lewis admits, I really don't know what women do when they get together. He even says, I've never spied on their mysteries. So Lewis's focus really is more male friendship, though I think it, it also relates. But here's one difference. I mean, I think what Lewis says here is true, but it's more true for male friendship. If you think for a moment about movies that you've been to, about, uh, like, there's, there are female buddy movies and there are male buddy movies. Whenever you go to a female buddy movie, think of the poster. The poster almost always shows the two women facing each other. Usually they're kind of, you know, like that, looking at each other or something. But it's interesting that mostly women buddy movies, they're facing each other. When it's a male buddy movie, they're always, they're side by side. You know, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid or the Westerns or war movies. They're always side by side facing the world. So really, I think it's more true about male friendship. But still, the point is that we are side by side doing something together as friends. Lewis explains more in the next quote. He says that, sorry, it's folding in on me. The, uh, he says, friendship is born when two people discover a common interest. What? You two? I thought I was the only one. Friendship, Lewis says, must be about something, even if it were only an enthusiasm for dominoes or white mice. Those who have nothing, those who have nothing, can share nothing. Those who are going nowhere can have no fellow travelers. Friendship is not something you get in, into as its own, for its own sake. You get into friendship because you have a shared interest or hobby or passion. And it's that which draws you together. Now, sometimes, Lewis says, you begin as companions at the club, the pool club or whatever, and then often it will develop into a friendship. But friendship needs as its anchor some kind of shared love or shared passion. Lewis tells us in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, about his first meeting with a man who would become a lifelong friend. His name was Arthur Greaves. Now, he was actually not an inkling because he was pretty much an invalid and was mostly bedridden and lived back in Belfast anyway. But he was Lewis's closest friend. And if you buy Lewis's collected letters, which are now available in three volumes, it's about that thick. Unbelievable. But you can buy just the letters Lewis sent to Arthur Greaves, and it's about that thick. Just the letters he sent to one friend. They were very, very close. Lewis tells us how their friendship began. Lewis was a huge fan of Norse mythology, and he loved the ring cycle. Are any of you taping the ring cycle right now? You don't know about this. PBS is showing the entire ring cycle on TV, on what is Channel 8, whatever it is on your cable, and it's, it's a you know, live filming of it was, they put on the performance, which is coming to Houston uh, in a few years. Uh, but Lewis loved the ring cycle, loved Norse mythology. Arthur Greaves was a young man who was bedridden, and Lewis's father said, why don't you go talk to the kid and be nice and you know, be gentlemanly, be, be neighborly? So Lewis went over, and he walked into the room, and here is Arthur, and here's Lewis, and there's a table in between them. And on the table is a book of Norse mythology. And Lewis said, I looked at the book, and I looked at Arthur, and Arthur looked at the book and looked at me as if to say, you like this too? And they became fast friends for the rest of their life. It bonded them together. And of course, the Inklings had many, many shared loves, particularly in terms of fantasy and children's literature and other things like that, and Christianity. Uh, they had shared interests that drove them together and made them enjoy being in that company. Let me show you something funny, particularly about male friendship. Again, this is not so much true about female friendship. But in male friendship, you have to have something in common. Let me explain. If I went up to my male friend and I said, hey, John, this weekend, why don't we go up into the woods and we'll light a fire and we'll share intimate stories with one another all weekend? <laughs> I don't think I would see John again, okay? <laughs> but if I went to John and I said, John, what do you say this weekend? We go up to the woods, we build a fire, we tell stories, and while we're doing it, we will kill some animals. It's okay now, isn't it? Okay? 
we now have something that we share in common. So now it's okay. And like I said, that's what's different. I think two women would have no problem going up and just sharing stories. But the man's got to have a reason for it. Some kind of pretext or justification for getting together. Sharing intimacy is not enough. Right? Um, it's kind of a red flag. Uh, so, again... Friendship, Lewis says, is about something, and it joins us together. Uh, as, again, was the case with Arthur Greaves, with Tolkien, and already Dr. Stacy told you that they form this group. It's called the coal biters or coal batars. It's the people that sit so close to the fire in Scandinavia. It's like they're biting the coals. And they read out loud together in, in the original Norse, all of the Norse sagas and old English sagas, and they finally disbanded the group because they read through all of them which is quite an accomplishment over the fire and things like that with their pipes and things like that. So, Anyway, all right, let's move on um, uh, to uh, what, one more quote at the, at the bottom here, a little bit longer quote. Lewis argues that in a circle of true friends, each man is simply what he is, stands for nothing but himself. No one cares tuppence about anyone else's family, profession, class, income, race, or previous history. Of course, you will get to know about most of these things in the end, but casually. Friends meet like sovereign princes of independent states abroad on neutral ground, freed from our context. Eros will have naked bodies. Friendship will have naked personalities. Now again, I think this is probably more true of male friendship. Okay, a lot of women friendship get together, talk about their family and things like that. Now men, you know, may be very much family men, but when they're with their friends... They don't tend to talk about that. They tend to talk about other things, things they share in common, their interests, their passions, their hobbies. Friendship is a way to get away from all those responsibilities and just be yourself. And actually, it might really work well for the women to do that too because sometimes you, you know, women feel such a burden uh, of the family and all these other things and now job and everything thrown on top of it uh, that sometimes it's not necessarily a bad thing to just put all of that aside but again, men can do that better because men are more about compartmentalizing. So again, I really do think this is a little bit of a difference between the sexes that maybe Lewis wasn't you know, thinking that was in his focus here. Um, but again, there's something neat about friendship. It's just me. Doesn't make, I'm, I'm not now a professor. I'm not a father. I'm not a husband. I'm not a son. I'm just me. And we're here together and sharing this time together. We don't want to know. Now, I will say that it's interesting Lewis says this because my sense from reading the letters of the Inklings and others is that Lewis, as, as in a sense a sort of leader of the Inklings, always insisted that family be kept out. He wasn't against family, but we were here to talk about our writing. I get the sense that Tolkien would have liked to talk about his family a little bit more, but Lewis, this is very British anyway, isn't it? Sort of separation. It was a very British male thing anyway. Um, but I, I think, you know, some of you know that Tolkien was not too crazy about Lewis when he got married to Joy and stuff. And I think he's got a right to be a little upset because when Lewis married Joy, he wanted to bring her to all of their meetings. And he had always forbidden everybody else to, but Joy was just one of the guys or something like that, and Lewis wanted to bring her. And I do think there was a little bit of resentment maybe on Tolkien's part. Um, but again, I still think generally speaking, especially when we're talking about male friendship, that there's a lot of truth to this. We get to be just ourselves and get away from all the different pressures that identify us and put us in different categories. We can just be ourselves. Now, if you look at number three, you'll see maybe one of the reasons why Lewis dragged joy with him and didn't see that as maybe a little bit hypocritical. Lewis says that eros and philia can sometimes coincide. He says, nothing so enriches erotic love as the discovery that the beloved can deeply, truly, and spontaneously enter into friendship with the friends you already had. To feel that not only are we two united by erotic love, but we three or four or five are all travelers on the same quest, all have a common vision. And I think that's what he was seeing, that sometimes, you know, when you're really close, you can bring those people into your friendships. But Lewis admits that even though that happens sometimes, more often than not, things have changed a lot today, but more often than not, in most cultures where men and women are involved in different pursuits, friendships are generally confined to one's own sex. And guess what? There's nothing wrong with that. Lewis says, where the sexes, having no real shared activities, can meet only in affection and eros, cannot be friends, it is healthy that each should have a lively sense of the other's absurdity. There is nothing wrong 
with male friendship and female friendship. We, have an, we live in an extremely annoying age that pushes more mingling of the sexes than is needed. Now, that's cool. I'm glad I teach and have male and female colleagues and all of this sort of stuff. But there are times when men need to be together and women need to be together. And our society refuses to accept that or even understand it. And in fact, okay, here's, here's a problem. We now live in a, in a society that is so competitive. And you often hear about the battle of the sexes. And I bet a lot of young people today think the battle of the sexes means men and women fighting over jobs. That is not what the battle of the sexes means, or at least not what it has meant for the last couple thousand years. What battle of the sexes means in a good Shakespeare comedy or a good Jane Austen novel, what battle of the sexes means is men looking at female things and thinking they're ridiculous, and women looking at male things and thinking they're ridiculous. I mean, read like, uh, which one is it? Uh, 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 Much Ado About Nothing, you get a little bit of it there. You get a lot of it, of course, in Taming of the Shrew. Uh, 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 Comedy of Errors has a really good scene where the husband and wife are sort of back and forth, back and forth about you women, you care about things that are unimportant. You men, why don't you care about this? That's the joy, that's the joy of romantic comedies. Uh, Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant, ever see some of those wonderful old comedies? or the, the newest one uh, that got it started again was When Harry Met Sally. And if you remember, the, the whole point of When Harry Met Sally was the question, can men and women be friends without it becoming erotic? And if you watch the movie carefully, the answer is clearly no. Okay? <laughs> it's very clearly, if you watch the end of that, the only way it works is when they get married. Um, but the, the, the point here is that we need to understand that there is value in being with our own sex for extended periods of time. Look. One of the wonderful things about teaching in HBU is HBU represents Houston. And so we have an incredible diversity at the school. We have a very large percentage of students that even have a Muslim, a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Jewish background. We have a real smorgasbord here, which is wonderful. Now, again, Islam is in the news all the time, right? And most Americans, when they watch footage and they see the poor Muslim women wearing their veil and walking around, get really, really angry. Right? And I can understand that. I'm an American. I'm all about freedom and liberty and all this sort of stuff. I, don't, I wouldn't want to see my wife and daughter have to be you know, covered up and stuff. But let me tell you something that a lot of times we don't realize in the West. Even though women in Muslim countries have less political rights, often less economic rights, etc., etc., the women in most Muslim countries have something that American women don't. I would argue that in most cases, Arabic women do not suffer from something that American women suffer from all the time. And this is one of the worst things that anyone can suffer from, but it's particularly hard on women. And you know what I'm talking about? I am talking about loneliness. One of the hardest things in America is loneliness. If a woman is not linked to a family in some way or another, it is very, very difficult. If you know anything about Arabic or more generally Mediterranean cultures, you will know that in those cultures they have what's often referred to as a community of women. Women are not alone. They may not have the rights that our women do, but they generally are not lonely. They are together with other women, doing tasks together. Uh, I don't know if anybody here is a Mediterranean, my, my family's Greek, if you're Greek or, or Jewish or Italian or something like that, North African, you will know that when Mediterranean people, it's true, pretty much true of Hispanics too in general, a Mediterranean family, we get together for a big dinner, right, and everybody's eating, and by the end of the night, what has happened to the group? They have split. All the women are in, are in the kitchen, and all the men are in the den. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that, okay? It's done naturally. It's not like they're trying to get away from the other one. We have our own concerns, and we need to be alone. Then we need to come together in other parts. But it can be a very positive thing. It helps us to learn who we are as a man or a woman, a boy or a girl. These are important things. And sometimes our society forces a mingling when they shouldn't. Lewis says it uh, rather strongly, uh, if you continue on there. He says... A wife who does, okay, I'm sorry, C.S. Lewis critiques wives who break in on their male friends all the time, okay? And he says, a wife who does this, quote, does not realize that the husband whom she succeeds in isolating from his own kind will not be very well worth having. She has emasculated him. She will grow to be ashamed of him herself. The wife who does this may be quite as clever as the men whose evening she has spoiled or clever, but she is not really interested in the same things. Her grandmother was far happier and more realistic. She was at home talking real woman's talk to other women and perhaps doing so with great charm, sense, 
and even wit. Now again, things have changed since Lewis's day. Because men and women are working together, we have more in common. But still, I want to tell the young people here. Over half the crowd are students. What did I do with my ears? Um, where's Waldo? Okay, there it is. I want to give you a very important piece of advice that it took me a long time to, to realize, okay? Because if you are a young student, especially a young Christian student, a young romantic student, you have this idea that when you find the right husband or wife, that person will be everything to you. That person will fulfill every one of your needs. You will do everything together. You will never be apart. And I am a very romantic kind of person. And I grab, you know, you watch Hollywood and all that sort of stuff. I will tell you right now, that is not true. And it's okay that it's not true. You need, and, and, and the, 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 the parents and grandparents here can tell you this afterwards. If you want a healthy marriage, guys, you need to keep your male friends. And ladies, you need to keep your female friends. And you need to encourage your spouse to spend time with their friends. Now, obviously, if, if, you're, if you're the woman and, you're, and your husband's friends are getting him drunk and on drugs, that's one thing. Or if you're the man and, and your wife's friends are turning her to you know, absolute vanity and consumerism and all that nonsense, then yeah, you should speak up. That's part of being a good husband or wife. But generally speaking, you need to be encouraging your spouse to spend time with their friends. This is very, very important. You cannot expect your husband or wife to share every single one of your interests. If you did, then you are Henry Higgins, who ends his famous song, A Hymn to Him, that begins, Why Can't a Woman Behave Like a Man? Right? And he ends the song by saying, Why Can't a Woman Be Like Me? Okay? You're not marrying yourself, okay? You're marrying a very different person that you compliment with, and you need to let them have their space with other people. There are some things that women are only going to talk to other women about, and the same thing with men. This may shock a few of you, but, you know, obviously one of the big debates in, in, in media is talking about gay marriage and stuff like that. And there's all sorts of very important biblical and moral issues here. But there's one issue that nobody ever talks about. And you're going to think I'm being facetious, but I'm not. Let me tell you the major problem with gay marriage. It's too easy. That is the main problem with gay marriage. It is too easy, okay? There is nothing harder than a man and a woman staying married for 50 years. There's also nothing more rewarding, but it is difficult, okay? None of this talk, oh, you know, two gay men, one is more masculine, one is more nonsense. They're both men, okay? And two lesbian women are both women, and they think and react and process information like men or women. It's too easy, okay? We are meant to refine each other, right? You can't change your husband or wife. You're meant to refine one another, and we need those friendships. The stronger our friendships are, the stronger our marriage will be. And by the way, to go back to something I said earlier, the stronger the husband and wife link is, the better parents you're going to be, right? You know when you get on the airplane and it says, in an emergency, the masks will come. First, they start by saying, for your convenience, the cabin has been pressurized. Didn't know it was, uh, you know, nice of you to let me breathe. Thank you. Because pretty soon, United Airways is going to charge us to breathe, all right? If we pay $50, we breathe. If not, we have to wear the mask the whole time. I, I believe you. This is coming. This is coming, Okay. I told my son, I really, I really despise United Airlines. I only give them one brownie point, and that is their good taste because Rhapsody in Blue is their, is their, is their music. That's the only thing. One time I, I spent 15 minutes waiting for an operator and never got one, but at least I listened to Rhapsody in Blue three times. So <laughs> that's about the only saving grace uh, for those guys. But anyway, um, what do they say? If you are with a young child, what does it tell you to do? Put your mask on first and then assist your child, okay? If, you're, if your marriage is strong, then you can be a good mother or father. If your marriage is a mess, you're not going to be a good mother or father, right? I'm not saying you're going to be terrible, but it's going to be harder to do what you need to do. So, again, please remember this, students, when you are married. And if you need help finding that person, just come to me. Um, <laughs> remember this when you're married. You need to maintain those friendships. It is very, very important. Okay, I'm going to move to my last point, but first, I always forget these things. I've got a few announcements. Um, I brought with me... Uh, cards for my new book that's coming out in October. So if anybody wants them, they can come later. Uh, it's, it's coming out in October. Also, uh, I'm doing a class in Rice on the Odyssey. This is for the non-HBU students. You need to be here. But anybody that wants to learn about the Odyssey, I'm doing a speech in the October, four weeks in October. I'll put this up here. And very, very important, um, 
Last year, I did an adaptation of Iphigenia in Taurus, which is a play by Euripides, and this Greek acting troupe performed it. It was really, really neat. So this year, I did an adaptation of Helen by Euripides. It's one of those strange Greek tragedies that has a happy ending, and it's going to be performed here, uh, not here, but in the big hall over there, November 9th. It's a Friday night, and you can get your tickets online. So I've got a few of these uh, if anybody's interested afterwards. Okay, let's look at point number four. Let's get a little more serious. Over the last hundred years, friendship has been under attack. And that's another reason why Lewis felt he not only had to revive it, he had to actually defend it. And interestingly, friendship has been attacked by both the great tyrannies of the 20th century and by the great democracies of the 20th century. Friendship is under attack by tyrannies because tyrants know that friends together are strong. Famous writer E.M. Foster wrote Passage to India and Howard's End, really great British writer, wrote a short essay called Why I Write. And he made a famous, almost an infamous statement. He said, if I had to choose between betraying my friends and betraying my country, I hope I would have the courage to betray my country. Now, that's maybe a little farther than I would go, but it's stating it in its stronger sense. That friendship, and in this case, particularly male friendship, is often something that has brought freedom into the world, that has stood up and resisted the tyrants of the world. I think we need to revive that great old Oscar Hammerstein song. Do you all remember it? What is it? Um, uh, what is it? Uh, give, give me some men who are start. How did men remember? Who will fight for the right they adore? Somebody must remember. Start me with 10 who are start hearted men, and I'll soon give you 5,000 more, right? If a few people will stand side by side, they can change things. They can change things. Uh, and Lewis actually lists, I gave you a list of what Lewis said, of some of the great changes that were made by friends. First of all, romanticism was partly started or born out of the friendship between William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. That friendship birthed a, a, a work called Lyrical Ballads, and it gave other people courage. And there were other poets, we call lake poets, those are just the most famous, but they produced a lot of stuff, right? Lewis here calls it uh, tractarianism, but some of you know it better as the Oxford Movement. In the 19th century, as the Anglican Church was getting more and more theologically liberal and moving away and all that stuff, a group of people led by Cardinal Newman, who eventually became Catholic, uh, then he was called Cardinal Newman, um, bounded together, and this friendship gave them the courage to start a movement called the Oxford Movement, which sort of purified the church and brought it back to its real status. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but, you know, sometimes in life there's a culminating point for something. Well, it's interesting because all of the hard work of the Oxford Movement actually culminated in one single human being who is in this room. His name is Dr. Matt Bolston, okay? The entire Oxford movement has culminated in the Anglican Bolston back there. Okay, you student, I guess you students don't know why that's funny. It's all right. You can tease him later. Um, another, another one he lists is abolitionism. Now, he's thinking, of course, about Britain. William Wilberforce, if you saw Amazing Grace, that was a group of friends that got together, partly a prayer meeting, that got together and worked together and brought about the abolition of the slave trade. A lot of the abolitionists in our country were friends that had the courage to work together. He lists things like the Renaissance and the Reformation was partly spurred forward by friends who, because they were side by side, had more courage. Jesus sent out the disciples two by two. Remember that? Paul and Barnabas, when they were together, were an unstoppable team. If it wasn't for their friendship, Paul might have never gotten together with the Jerusalem church, right? So friendship gives us the courage to step forward and change things. Tyrants don't like that. But guess what? And here's the challenge for us. A lot of democracies don't like friendship. Because democracies have a tendency towards egalitarianism, making everybody the same. And they don't like friendship. Oh, you think you're better than me? Okay. Some, sometimes there's a feminist aspect. What are you men doing together? You better get with those women or something like that. It's unfair or something like that. Uh, and, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, it's unfair because an old boys network helps you get jobs. And so the women are losing their jobs. Uh, I, I would call that a pretext for what they're really trying to do. And that is break up the friendship. Um, democracies don't like that. They want everybody to be the same. That is a Aristotle pointed out this danger 2,400 years ago. 
There's a danger of pushing and pushing and pushing. They don't like friends because they stand against. When friends are together, they have courage to resist the status quo. Whatever that status quo may be. It could be conservative, liberal, whatever it is. The, the friendship can stand against it. But, and now let's come back to what I said earlier, but now a little more serious. Unfortunately, in our country, particularly male friendship is in grave danger because it is attacked from the outside and it's attacked from the inside. It is attacked from the outside by people who say, you're elitist, you're sexist, whatever, break up your friendship. Unfortunately, it is attacked from the inside by the growth of the gay movement. Now, it's not like the gay people are trying to break up. What's happening, though, is because it's become so prominent in our culture, every man in this room knows what I'm talking about. If a man wants to be really close with their friend, unless it's the male suite that we have that are sophomores, if a, known as the troll suite sometimes, uh, but again, two men that are, that are not gay, that are straight, they're often embarrassed to walk into a restaurant together because they think other people are going to think they're lovers. And seriously, this is a problem. A lot of men today in our culture resist intimacy with their fellow men because they're afraid of what society will say. And this is a problem because one of the ways that men come to know what it means to be a man is by having rough play with other men. It includes smacking them on the butt and all the things athletes do and stuff like that. And it sounds funny to us now, but this is part of the way that men come to understand what it means to have a male body as opposed to a female body. And a lot of times when men don't have the chance to do that, they never come quite in, in, in control of their own sexuality and their own physicality. Friendship. I was just sharing this with my students earlier this week. I am so glad that the movie Lord of the Rings was made by Australians. If it was made by Americans, it would have missed something. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? One of the core central things that made that movie so beautiful was the close intimate friendship between Sam and Frodo. Believe me, if Americans had made that movie, they would have been afraid. Of it. They would not have made a closeness like that. And I've heard Americans say, oh, are Sam and Frodo gay? No, they're not. It's a Obviously, uh, Australians are more in touch with their masculinity than we are. Uh, we're the ones that have the problem, not them. Okay? And it's not just them. I mean, when I was in, in, in college, I had a good friend who was from Africa, and I remember he walked up to me in the quadrangle and took my arm and started walking with me. And I said to him, it was Rauf, I said, Rauf, now I'm a Greek and it doesn't bother me. But you need to understand we're in America now, and this will be misinterpreted. And it's terrible that I have to say, and he was kind of shocked when I said that. But this is crazy. Most of the rest of the world doesn't worry about that, okay? Of course, you all know that there's a real weird thing in our, in, our, in our world, that people that live in the hotter countries are the ones who are always hugging each other. And people that live in the cold northern climes of Scandinavia don't want to touch anybody. I've never understood that. You would think all of those Germans and, 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 and Swedes would be hugging each other every five minutes to keep warm, and all the Hispanics would say, get away from me, you stink, okay? But it is the opposite. I don't understand this. I, I, I gotta write a paper about this or figure this out, okay? But, but really, we need that club, especially I mean, women too, but women can get away. I mean, women can still go and dance with one another in a club and not necessarily be thought of as gay, but two men are not gonna do that, okay? Unless they're in the troll suite. Uh, they're not gonna, they're not, <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to do that, okay? And actually, just on a serious note, the freshman honors college uh, group that's now sophomores, I really like these guys because we ended up with one suite of girls, we called them the fairy suite, and they are really girly, almost to distraction. Uh, and then there is a male suite, we haven't come up with a name for them, the girls call them the troll suite, but they don't call themselves that. They're just the troll suite. There we go, okay, she's insisting. <laughs> See, the, fa the fairy speaks, right? And... It's wonderful because there is a good kind of battle of the sexes between these people, okay? They, 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 they make videos to try to be better. I mean, this is a good, healthy thing. This is how we come to know who we are as boys and girls, men and women. And that is very difficult to do in our day and age. And that's really, really a shame. Finally, I wish I could end on a positive note, but Lewis reminds us something at the very end of the outline there. And Lewis sent, says this. Uh, very much at the bottom. He says, friendship, as the ancients saw, can be a school of virtue, but also, as the ancients did not see, a school of vice. It is ambivalent. It makes good men better and bad men worse. And this is important. Sometimes friendship among thieves can be a bad thing, right? I mean, you need to understand that the, the original knights and the concept of the knight 
does not come from Greece and Rome, and it doesn't come from Christianity. It comes from the, uh, the Germanic barbarian groups. That's where it comes from. And eventually, the Catholic Church got a hold of the knights and civilized them as much as they could, turned them into cowboys, civilized them as much as they could. But you need to understand that originally, the concept of chivalry amongst knights only meant that you have to be chivalrous towards other knights. The peasants, you can rape and pillage all you want. So, I mean, there, there is a dark side to friendship, okay? It can be a kind of bad elitism. In fact, friendship, Lewis said in, in a famous essay, friendship can become what he called the inner ring. And Lewis believed that one of the greatest evils in the world was the inner ring. That's when a group get together for, for purposes of power and control, and if anybody wants to join their group, they have to abase themselves, do all these terrible things, and they're on the inside looking out... That's bad. Totalitarian, you know, groups that, can, you know, like a Mao Zedong's inner circle or something like that, that uses their closeness to control and destroy everybody around them. So Lewis, even though he loved friendship and was an apologist for it, he also knew that there were real dangers, right? Because, you know, it can always lead to a mob mentality. If all my friends are doing it, it's okay. That's the danger of, I'd rather betray my friends, I'd rather betray my country than betray my friends. That can be a problem. And you could decide what A.M. E. Foster meant by it, but that can be negative, okay? But finally, I don't want to end on that, on that negative note. The positive note, one last thing to tell you about the Inklings. All right. A lot of people don't realize that it is because of the Inklings that fairy tales and children's stories have such a high reputation today. If you go back to the late 19th century, the Victorian age, and after that what we call the Edwardian age, that was a golden age of children's literature and fairy tales. That was the time of Wind in the Willows, Dr. Bolson. That was the time of the Jungle Book, of Beatrix Potter's wonderful tales. I mean, this was an era. George MacDonald wrote his stories then. This was an age that really produced. And if, if, if any of you saw the opening of the Olympics, the opening ceremonies, the British did a little skit about their wonderful children's Mary Poppins and all that sort of stuff. They're very famous for that. What a lot of people don't know is that during the 1920s and 30s, particularly between the wars, because of the horror of World War I, fairy tales and children's literature went way down in reputation. And nobody took them seriously. They were considered escapism. And, and, and Tolkien was attacked early on for his writings as being escapist. Right? We are realistic. We're not escapists. You know what Tolkien said? If you're in prison, you want to escape. Okay? Escapism is not necessarily a bad thing. It depends where you are. Okay? Um, but anyway, what the, what the Inklings did is they encouraged each other in their writing, and they didn't write, you know, for each other, but they critiqued each other, and they affirmed each other, and they said, let's do this. There is a famous uh, meeting between Tolkien and Lewis when the two friends were both complaining that nobody was writing the kind of stories they liked anymore. You see, Tolkien says that old genres are like old furniture. When it goes out of style, you put it in the nursery. Do you ever notice? Nursery furniture is Victorian furniture that's out of style. Well, the same thing happens with children's literature and fairy tales. And both Lewis and Tolkien agreed that a story that's only worth reading by a child is probably not worth reading at all. Well, they were complaining. Why is nobody writing the stuff we love, the kind of fairy tales that could be read by children and adults, the kind that, that had, you know, meat to them? And they are, you know, as we all do, why is, you know, why is it like the old days? Until suddenly, a light bulb flashed in Lewis's head, and he said, you know what, Tolkien? It looks like we're going to have to write the kinds of books we want to read. How's that? And so the inkling sat down, and wrote the kinds of books they wanted to read. And they helped to raise the reputation so much so that if you go to a large university, they will generally have a whole major in children's literature. Lewis and Tolkien also helped raise the reputation of science fiction in its early days. Lewis wrote a trilogy of science fiction novels that they're not necessarily classics of the genre. I think they are. Uh, but they did help to give uh, credence to this early science fiction movement. And so... When friends get together, you know what happens? When we're together, we're not embarrassed. If make people make fun of us, it's okay. At least this guy's reading it. There was a time when the Lord of the Rings had two fans, Christopher Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. And that fan club 
is what pushed Tolkien to finish it and publish it. Lewis didn't write The Lord of the Rings, but Lewis's support kept Tolkien writing and got him to publish it, and Lewis wrote one of the first positive critiques of it. So remember that friendship is important. It is something, I mean, think of the disciples. They were friends, and out of that friendship comes courage, and out of that courage, we can change the world. Thank you all. <laughs> Oh, do we make it through? Let's see what time it is. Thank you. Oh, okay. Do we get to sit in the big chairs? I like this. Masterpiece Theatre. Alistair Cook. <laughs> well, first of all, Dr. Marcos, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Marcos has agreed to take a few questions from the audience. While you're formulating your question, I'm exercising first right as moderator to ask a question, but please uh, just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. While we're waiting though, um, as you know, I'm the father to three boys. Good. I do not apologize for their boyness, Good. and they are very boyish. Here's a question I have for you though. My, my poor wife has to sometimes deal with this problem. She will sometimes get calls from other mothers who will say things like, you know, your, your son did X to my daughter or to my boy, and he's, you know, he said she had cooties or whatever. Oh. Uh, now, my first reaction is, well, how do you know she doesn't have cooties? That's right. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. I would have said the same thing. But what you were talking about sort of put me in mind of something here. We do seem to have a cultural problem. We just, as a culture, seem to reject the notion of masculinity, particularly when it comes to masculine pursuits among men. What those mothers are sometimes criticizing right. is really sort of natural masculine behavior. Good. I, I think, I mean, first of all, if you notice my, my thing here, it's the Boy Scouts. My, my son over there, over there is an Eagle Scout. And you need to uh, help out the Boy Scouts. Because I'm, I'm serious. I wish I was joking here. But the Boy Scouts is, I think, the only group left in America. The, uh, there's also 4-H, but we don't have that down here, I don't think. It's the only group left in America that encourages boys to be boys. And this is important. You've got to let boys be boys. Okay? Uh, and and uh, by the way, I, I, I'm convinced that the reason all the bad boys wear their pants all the way down is because they grew up with mothers that made them wear their pants up here. Okay? <laughs> now, the reason mothers make their boys look like Urkel is because women have hips that are different than ours. And so they think, okay, and we'll go into that. But, <laughs> you know, this bothers me. But anyway, the, well, let me get it, because what Dr. Stacey said is so right. I mean, I am furious at the public school when a boy acts out and tries to be a boy, they put him on Ritalin. I mean, literally, they're, they're telling him he's a problem. He's not a problem. He's being a boy. They need to be encouraged to be boys. And we've got to, you know, and, and of course, you know, there, there's, a, there's a division of labor in men and women. The, the role of the husband is to rile the kids up. The role of the wife is to calm them down and put them to bed. I mean, that's just, you know, just the way it works. Okay, but anyways, I let my wife go to sleep. I rile them up, and then I put them to bed at about 2 in the morning. But anyway, the, um, but no, seriously, th this is so important. We... You need to understand what's going on in our public schools and even some of our private schools. When boys speak up and try to take control, try to show leadership uh, uh, things, they're put down. They're put down, okay? And a lot of times the girls rise up and become leaders partly because there's not a single man that will do it, okay? I mean, none of them will do it. And, and this is really a problem because without that leadership from these guys, we're going to be in a great deal of trouble. So we need to let the boys... B-boys understand that they're different than the girls and emphasize that, right? You know, you can try giving a boy a doll, but what he'll do is turn it into a weapon and beat his sister on the head, as indeed he should. <laughs> um, so so I, I agree. Th thank you for that point. And, and we do need to, to fight for that, okay? I mean, obviously, we want to teach him not to do something that's cruel, okay? But that's different than saying not to do something that is boyish. They need to you know, stretch out their limbs and go a little wild and go a little crazy, okay? Because otherwise, when they get married and their wife is intensely uptight, there won't be a man to say, relax, dear, it's okay, you see? We need to say this, okay? The, the number one word spoken by a husband is relax. The number one word spoken by, by wife is get going, okay? So we need to balance each other. And I, I really am frightened that there will be a crisis of male leadership in our country. I think it's coming right now. And, and it starts with boys when we beat it out of them. So, good stuff. Other thoughts? I had to stand up for that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Too passionate. Do we have any questions from the audience?
Mm -hmm. Um, there, there's also a rich literature that goes through Cicero to yeah. Bernard of Clairvaux to Eyred de Riveau on, on friendship. Does Lewis show awareness of, of this literature? He does, he does quote almost everything. I mean, for Lewis, it always starts with Aristotle. And in fact, when Lewis writes on virtue, he quotes Aristotle more than the Bible. Not because he doesn't believe in the Bible, but because it's already there in Aristotle. But he does. I mean, for Lewis, especially what you said there, you know, Lewis also understands the Roman concept of friendship and citizenship and how there's a relationship between those two. You know, the, 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 the Roman Republic, you know, when they bonded together and fought off the thing. But Lewis also, for Lewis and Tolkien, they really looked to a lot of old English models, particularly. They looked at... Um, you know, some of the stories in Beowulf, uh, they looked at things like the Fairy Queen. I mean, they were really interested in the romances and the Middle Ages and the... Fr you know, a good example of that would be, um, what do you call that, uh, Charlemagne and his paladins, which is kind of like King Arthur and his knights. There was Charlemagne and his paladins, which are, you know, around uh, the, ninth, the ninth century uh, of the Middle Ages. And so Lewis was pretty, pretty wide-ranging when he looked at different kinds of friendship uh, and... I mean, he, he even understood it. I mean, I only gave you a few quotes, but he even talks about uh, tribal groups and friendships that spring up between men going on the hunt. So Lewis even takes a little bit of, I guess we would call it an anthropological, uh, cultural anthropology look at things. So if you read the chapter in, in, in The Four Loves, he does quote most of these different things. He's really, he has a deep understanding uh, of it in its medieval context as well as its ancient context. Questions? You see something? Oh, there. I actually have two questions. Um, one is your thoughts on the nature of role reversal in society and to what degree that might part. Not that I have anything against like stay at home dads or anything like that, but um, your thoughts on how that might be partially a consequence of declining friendship, as you were talking about. Hmm. And then. Um, the other question was about your thoughts on a lifelong friendship versus a short term. Uh, uh, if you do, for someone who maybe have more eclectic interest and just change their interests periodically. That's good. Let's take the second one first because okay. Lewis does talk about this too. He says that there are some kind of people that are more acquaintances or companions rather than friends. And these are people that work in the same business and they have everything in common, but as soon as what they had in common is gone, they don't see each other. And actually, Aristotle talks about this too. And he says there's no problem with that. Right? There, there, there are some friendships that are for a time and then they're gone. When you, when you cease to have anything in common, you're not really friends anymore. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. When you talk about role reversal, again, I really do think there is a crisis in this age. There are a lot of guys, and I'm not making fun of them, but just don't know what it means to be a man. There are a lot of women that don't know what it means to be a woman, but I, I, that seems to be less of a trouble these days than the men because they're getting much more mixed signals, I think. And there is a sense, who am I? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a leader? What does it mean to take responsibility for my actions? I mean, like I said, I mean, it, 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 you know, there might be a situation where, the, where he is a house husband and stuff like that, but that is not going to be the norm. And oftentimes, in a situation like that, if that goes on and on and on, I've known an awful lot of women who've just left their husband, okay, uh, because they cease to respect him. Now, that doesn't have to happen, okay, um, but it is problematic. See, part of the problem in our country is the, the basic traditional understanding of complementarity is that men and women are different but of equal value. Unfortunately, we live in a country where we used to have this thing called separate but equal, I'm talking about the race relations, that was separate but was not equal at all. So our culture, because of our racist past, has a very hard time thinking that two things can be separate and yet equal in terms of value and worth. When you throw on top of that the fact that we're a democracy that has a tendency to push people to be the same. I, I, I know we have a lot of homeschoolers in this audience and a homeschooling parents in this audience. You get this pressure all the time. The kind of attacks made against friends are made against homeschooling families all the time. Even your good friends will say to you, well, your kids are not getting socialized. 
course, if socialization is bad, then why do you... That's like saying your kid better go to school so he can get measles like everybody else. I mean, I, I don't understand that. But, but there is actually a history to this. And your friend is probably not aware that they're doing this, okay? But I may get the sociologist down on me. But I consider... I know Dr. Stacy agrees with me, so that's okay. That one of the... One, the one 20th century figure in America that did more harm than almost anybody else was a guy named John Dewey, okay? And John Dewey was a, uh, an educator, right? And John Dewey was the guy that gave us this idea of socialization, of using the public schools to socialize people and get them together on his agenda. And again, your friend doesn't mean that when they say socialize, but that is the origin of it. That, that's where the sort of angst is coming from. It's very deep. Say, you know, in Germany, it's actually illegal to homeschool. You know that? And there's a couple other places. But in Germany, it is illegal. We have ways to socialize you, okay? Uh, you will be the same, and you will not stick out, and you will not be special. And, 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 uh, and so we need to resist that. No way. We, obviously, if everybody homes, homeschool, we might be a little problem, okay? But we need homeschoolers not only for they themselves, but so that society sees we don't have to make everybody the same, okay? We don't have to push everybody together into the same stew. People can still be distinctive, right? I, I don't, it's really, Lewis says this, and I think this is still true 60 years later. Lewis said, if you say to a woman, you wear the pants in the family, she's not going to take that as a compliment. Even a lot of feminist women would not take that as a compliment, right? And so he said, even the women themselves are ashamed if they are literally bossing their husband around, okay? Um, but again, it, it's, what we need to do is, uh, let, let, me, let me end with this and I'll explain this. Okay, Here, Here's the problem, okay? The problem is the word sexism. It has changed its meaning radically over the last 40 or 50 years. Back in the 50s, a sex, uh, we're talking about a man particularly, a sexist man or a male chauvinist was somebody who treated men and women exactly the same. That was a sexist or a male chauvinist. He insisted on treating women just like they were men. Today, you're considered a sexist if you don't treat men and women exactly the same. That is the difference. That is what's changed. So we, no, no longer do we affirm femininity and masculinity. We have collapsed everything. And usually when you collapse things, what gets hurt the most is femininity. That sort of gets left out, and what you end up with is a sort of atrophied masculinity controlling everything else, right? I wrote a, a letter. I guess it made my wife happy. Uh, my wife had a, a, a boss. She's a nurse, and she had a boss uh, who was a woman, and she'd been working for all these years, and I finally felt I needed to write her a letter because I was thinking about all these issues. And I wrote her, and I said, and I also wrote a letter like this to one of my uh, chairs who was a woman many, many years ago. And I said to her in the letter, 40 years ago, when women started coming in full force into the workforce, I thought this was going to be great because these women were going to come into the workforce and bring feminine touch to things. They would bring more cooperation. They would bring more nurturing. They would bring more, you know, they would, they would bring something that would vitalize the workforce and make it more human. Unfortunately, what happened, especially in the East Coast, I'm from New Jersey, what happened was the women came in and they became more competitive and cutthroat than the men. In other words, they went in and threw out their femininity and became men. But what I liked about my wife's boss and the boss I used to have is that they were great chairmen, not in spite of being women, but because they were women. They were able to make the group under them like a family and nurture them, right? And that, that's the ideal. But too often, now again, things are better in the South than they are in the North, just generally speaking, okay? Uh, but a lot of times, women go into things and feel like to be successful, they have to deny their femininity and act like a man. Men with, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, men without breasts or something is what they call them. Men with breasts, what am I saying? Um, and and this, this is a problem, okay? This hurts femininity. And so we're finally at a place in our culture where we can affirm masculinity and femininity. That doesn't mean a woman can't work. It doesn't mean a husband cannot help take care of the children. It just means that we affirm because, let, let me end with this, okay? I'm speaking now specifically as a Christian. It's very clear in the Bible that it's not just our bodies that are masculine and feminine. Our souls are masculine and feminine. Now, our souls are not black, white, yellow, brown. God did not make us Caucasian, uh, uh, black, and, 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 and Asian, okay? God, but God did make us male and female. And the Bible says we will have resurrection bodies, okay? We will continue to
to be masculine and feminine. And we need to affirm these things and take joy out of it. I wrote a book I still have to find a publisher for called, called The Dangers of Egalitarianism. And I had a long chapter called In Praise of Femininity. And I went on for a whole chapter talking about all the special things that femininity brings into the world, to the work workplace, everywhere else. The chapter following it is called The Battle of the Sexes. And the first sentence of that chapter says, Now, I hope you don't think that because I spent the last chapter praising femininity that I always like it. Okay? I am a man and I am often extremely annoyed by the femininity of my wife, my mother, whatever happens to be my daughter. Right? Um, but the fact is that, that, that that's what Lewis meant by we need to have a sense of the other person's absurdity. This is so much fun. The battle of the sex is rightly understood. is a lot of fun. And we knock each other about, but we laugh and we understand it. Right? You, you, how many of you have read Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus? This is actually a very good book. Now, it's become ridiculous because it's been marketed and all that sort of stuff. But that book itself is very, very true, even if the guy that wrote it is kind of weird. And what he talks about is not the difference between male and female roles. He talks about the difference between how men and women interact and communicate with one another. And he uses two examples. I'll end with this. You'll all recognize this. One example is the wife comes home from work. Happens in my, in my house all the day and happens in your houses too. Wife comes home from work and she's all worried about something and she complains and complains. And when she's done, her husband says, all right, dear, now, when you go back to work tomorrow, you do A, B, and C and everything will be okay. One week later, the wife is coming back and making the same complaints. And like, didn't you listen to what I told you? Well, you see, the thing is that the woman was not looking for a fix -it job. The woman was looking to get it off her chest. The husband thinks he's being a good husband and being a good man by fixing the problem. But that's not what the wife is looking for. She's looking for an ear to listen to her. The other example he gives on the other side happens every family, my kids can attest to this, driving along, husband's driving, the wife never stops talking. Watch out for that! Watch out for that! Watch out for that! Watch out for that! Now, from the woman's point of view, she is helping. Women want to help other women. She would say that to her women friends. That's fine. From the man's point of view, his wife is infantilizing him and treating him as if he were a moron, okay? I do know how the traffic light works, right? So, but what's happening here is that there is a difference in the way we communicate and interact with other people. And until we realize it, once you realize that, it actually helps you in your marriage. If you realize, you know, then the husband can stop and say, oh, you're just getting it off your chest, honey, aren't you? Okay? And she could say, oh, you're, you don't like me saying that because you think I think you're stupid, right? Yes. Right? And so it's just little things like this. This is what we're talking about. We're not talking about there are some roles that men can't do and women can't do. I mean, again, things, things are always in changing and things like that, right? Uh, you know, heck, in, in, uh, in um, Muslim countries, for a long, long time, women have been gynecologists because they're not going to let a male doctor do that, right? So, you know, e even in Muslim countries, there are women doctors and things like that, partly just culturally. So it's not about roles. It is about the things that we affirm and bringing those together and being strengthened by that complementarity. So. Well, I didn't talk, expect to talk about that, but thank you. I get, are we out of time? Let me uh, just say, be, before we, before we uh, uh, conclude here tonight, uh, if you're a guest with us this evening, this is just the first in a series That's of right. lectures. We have five more coming up. On the, the wall like back that. there behind the, the last row of seats, you'll see a little flyer with the rest of the dates. So please feel free to take one of those with you as you go. On the other side of the aisle is uh, a little sign-up sheet. If you would care to, uh, we are happy to send you an email reminder of each of these uh, lectures as they come up. So if you want to put your name and your email address on there, we'll send you that reminder as well. So would you Join me in thanking Dr. Marcos. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.